hard time. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm your host, Captain Ryan. Today's YouTube video is going to be another subscriber submitted replay. This one comes from subscriber Dear Mr. Frodo. And if I can honestly say, that is a fantastic in game name. Dear Mr. Frodo is here in his Tier 8 Mogami. And from the looks of the setup, he's running that Mogami mostly stock. Now, the reason I say that is because he's running with the 15 155mm guns in five turrets. And while these guns are not necessarily terrible, they're pretty damn bad. And the reason they're so damn bad is because of their turret traverse speed. You're talking about having turrets that traverse so slowly, there are U.S. battleships at Tier 5 and Tier 6 that have better turret traverses. This used to not always be the case on the Mogami. In fact, the Mogami with the 155mm guns used to be the kind of OP ship. It was the layout and configuration that you absolutely wanted to go for. And if you were using the 203s, people looked at you funny like, why would you do that? The reason for this is because Way back when, in the closed and open beta, and even the early part of launch before this change was made, the captain's skills that you had available to you gave you the uh, buff to rotation speed for your turrets up to 156mm guns, which meant you got the 2.5 degree increase for the Mogami's gun, so that meant that your turrets could actually traverse quickly enough to be useful in a close-in maneuvering engagement, so you could actually go out and hunt destroyers with this ship really easily. The other thing that you had was things like the basics of an advanced firing training skills that also had those um, higher millimeter numbers, so you could increase the range with I think a range increase module on this ship, because it's tier 8, gave you an overall range capability of something like 19 kilometers. That meant that you could do in this ship what's now basically only reserved for the Zhao and the Kutuzov, which is to sit well outside of your detectability range and just light people on fire. And it was really one of those easy things to do. Unfortunately, Wargaming decided that they didn't like the fact that people were almost exclusively using this setup. And because people were using this setup exclusively, they weren't actually putting the time and resources into learning how to use the 203s again. And as a result, people were actually complaining that the Ibuki was very, very underpowered. Now, the other problem with the Mogami is that it's a Tier 7 cruiser at Tier 8. Yes, I called it a Tier 7 Cruiser. For those of us who have been around long enough, way back early on in the closed beta, we're well aware that the Mogami used to be at Tier 7. In fact, a lot of us pushed to have her at Tier 8 to swap her with the Miyoko, mostly because of the number of torpedoes that she gets versus the Miyoko and the you know better gun layout. The problem is Wargaming, while they listened to us and they swapped the tiers of the two ships, they didn't ever change the armor values. So the Mogami still has tier 7 armor values on her, while the Miyoka still has her tier 8 armor values. That means that the Miyoko is one of, you know, has the best armor values for tier 7, and that's why she's so OP at tier 7, why so many people like her. However, it might change eventually, but in the meantime, you're still left with an under-armored, basically floating citadel with slow traversing guns on those 155s. But the 155s can still be useful, as they still do have a good rate of fire, and you've got a lot of them, 15 of them. Now, dear Mr. Frodo is in his Mogami, and he has the misfortune 
of the matchmaker basically sticking him as the bottom tier ship in a tier 10 battle and this is a very much so tier 10 battle there are tier 10 cruisers there are tier 10 battleships and there are tier 10 destroyers all of these ships can pretty much destroy a Mogami just by looking at it wrong. I mean, a gearing can get within five kilometers and start citadeling the thing. So, what do you do if you find yourself in this situation where you've basically got a stock loadout, tier 8 Mogami, in a tier 10 battle? It doesn't really seem like there's much you can do. Well, our hero here is actually doing what you should do, as is the New Orleans behind him. You'll notice that he's using the islands for cover, and while his team has, you know, lost a couple of ships early on, giving the enemy team an advantage, you can see that his team has done a good job of dropping the HP of the enemy ships down more than their own. So they've lost two cruisers, but the enemy is lower on HP. So dear Mr. Frodo is using these islands for cover, and he's using the ship's maneuverability and concealment, and the Mogami does have excellent concealment if you get that concealment expert. In fact, the concealment on the Mogami is so good you can actually stealth launch torpedoes. <laughs> and then watch people wonder what the hell just happened to them. But you'll see, he's laying ambush tactics. So he's waiting back behind the islands, he's using the best armor he can. Solid granite, solid rock and trees, and of course working hitboxes on those islands. He pops his hydro consumable con and hopefully he can spot any potential torpedoes that come his direction from that Shimikaze who did pop up there. His team does manage to take one enemy ship out, but the enemies counter that by taking out one of their destroyers. However, they did have a destroyer advantage to begin the matchup with, so losing one destroyer isn't too bad. You'll see there as he's detected, he's got the, um, you know, priority targeting. He is being targeted by at least one ship there. So he's going to go ahead and move forward. He's lost sight of the battleship that he was shooting at, but he did manage to set the guy on fire. Now, I don't know if that fire is going to continue to burn. From the looks of it, that guy did put it out. He is still detected, but look at that detection radius. With the 155s, it's exactly his gun range. So if he's shooting at something that's just within his gun range, that's the only thing that can see him, especially if he kills him, then he can drop off detectability. He's going to push forward through these islands. There's some low health ships back behind these islands. You know, with any luck and any cunning, he can come out from behind here and surprise some of them. But again, you can see how slowly these guns maneuver. They traverse across the bow so slowly, it's just disgusting. The other advantage to the Mogami over the Miyoko, and the thing that I really like, is the gun layout of the forward turrets. Because they all face forward. It means that when you traverse from left to right, port to starboard, your gun turrets, you can, you know, get all three of those forward guns back on the target. Ships like the Miyoko, ships like the Izumo that have a similar forward turret setup, they have that third turret facing the other direction. And that turret means it's got to traverse over 180 degrees, and when you've got slow traversing turrets, like the stock Mogami ones, that's a long time to wait. I mean, just look at his rear guns here. They're barely even changing sides. So when you're playing with these turrets, you kind of have to think like you do with the American Battleship line, and the tips that I always say. Pick a side that your guns are going to be on, and that's the side that your guns are going to stay on, pretty much for most of the battle, unless you can get yourself behind cover and out of detection. His team has managed to pull the scores back as they've taken out more ships, and they are actually in the process of capping the enemy base. Mr. Frodo gets a nice good shot, sets that ship on fire, 
And he's got a second one that's also pretty low health, so he's going to go ahead and take shots at him. He doesn't get the kill on that battleship, a little disappointing, but let's see if he can set yet another fire and do even more damage. Just barely misses that cruiser. Doesn't matter. Cruiser's dead anyway. Now his team is in an advantage. You might be wondering what Mr. Frodo has done in this battle to warrant his own video. Well, the short answer is he's showing how to utilize the ship again. Bottom tier in a tier 8 battle. He's used the islands for covers and he's just kind of stayed in position. But he's been taking pot shots at whatever he can. And while he hasn't directly caused all that much damage or killed anybody outright, what he has done is caused damage. He's caused damage and he's helped divide the attention of the enemy ships, you know, who are looking at Amogami and thinking, ooh, fat, juicy Citadel, I can get big damage numbers and take somebody out of the game. So they switch their attention over to him before he disappears back behind an island. In the meantime, his teammates can continue their rate of fire on the enemy ships. And in general, that's what ends up doing it. He's just being a good team player. He's using the advantage of the map to get in close, and then he's using what he does have in his ship which is a good rate of fire with those 6-inch guns, and a you know, good chance for fires with those 6-inch guns. And he's just causing damage. He's just trying to help divide the attention to keep the enemies from paying attention to him. Enemy Shimikaze has popped up. He's very close. Can he kill him before he gets more torpedoes away? He does. Saves the friendly destroyer who's sitting in that cap. But of course, in the process, now he's garnered the attention of that enemy battleship who is going to fire at him. And of course, as I said, the Mogami's armor, not the best, but amazingly, he manages to avoid those shells coming in. And I take that back, it's not an enemy battleship, it's actually the Des Moines, who is firing armor piercing, and this is a little surprising. The Des Moines armor piercing is reasonable at close range, but at ranges like this where they're coming in kind of at an off angle, as well as the um, curvature, the arcs that they've got there, they aren't going to do a lot of damage to the Mogami. This Des Moines should really consider swapping over to high explosive and just setting him on fire, knocking out those gun turrets. Friendly ship over there took a huge hit from something and almost killed him outright, but he did survive just long enough. And now, the pressure is on at the enemy base. The enemies really have to, you know, they have to consider what they're going to do here. Yes, Mr. Frodo's base is wide open at this point, but there are at least two ships in their base camping. Now, Mr. Frodo is still firing the high explosive, but the Des Moines is giving him broadside, and I would honestly have already switched over to the armor piercing. However, Mr. Frodo is going to take the opportunity because the Des Moines is still giving him broadside, that he is going to ultimately switch over to that armor piercing. He's backing up here, the Des Moines has switched to high explosive and is setting him on fire. He's managed to knock out one torpedo too. Which is not really going to come into play in this game for Mr. Frodo. There's only two enemy ships left. The Des Moines has decided that Mr. Frodo's not worth it. Rather than keeping up the pressure and the fire on him, he decides he's going to go switch his attention to the destroyers there. The destroyers, he knows he can kill outright. But if the Des Moines had kept up the fire on Mr. Frodo, he could have set him on fire again and ensured yet another kill. Mr. Frodo switches back to the high explosive because the Des Moines is not giving broadside anymore. He's, you know, sailing away, giving the stern. And you see, high explosive did reasonable damage. The question is, can he secure another kill? He's done a lot of damage to this guy. It would be great if he did, and he manages to do it. So there's a two kills for him. He hasn't done all that much damage, comparatively speaking, but he has done a reasonable amount of damage. And again, being a team player, trying to divert that attention away from his destroyers, trying to, you know, just put fire out and provide assistance to his team. There's one enemy ship left, and at this point, that ship is a destroyer. 
there are three ships left on his team. And the enemy destroyer, if he plays it right, could go and probably win it. But that destroyer does have to make a decision here because the enemy is putting pressure on his base with Mr. Frodo, who is capping. And since he's high up on the cap, that means that the destroyer, if he wants to play to win, has to come back and has to reset the cap and or sink Mr. Frodo. But you notice Mr. Frodo is not just stopping in the cap, and I see a lot of players do this. They'll get in there, they'll kill off what they think is, you know, around them, and then they'll just stop. Mr. Frodo is not doing that, he is continuing to keep mobile because, well, as you can see, he's detected and he's being targeted. So he knows full well that that enemy destroyer is within range and looking at him. That probably means he's looking to torpedo him. And that would be bad considering how much health he has left. One torpedo dead center would probably finish him off. Mr. Frodo is going to take speculative torpedo shots just blindly and with any luck the enemy destroyer will be in the right position. I don't know if he has RDF on this captain, but it doesn't look like it. He's got a scout fighter up there, hopefully he can spot this destroyer, and he's got his hydroacoustic, that'll give him an advantage, early warning for any torpedoes headed his direction. That destroyer has got to open up if he wants to reset the cap, and if he wants to delay the probable and inevitable victory that Mr. Frodo's team's going to have. And, yep, there it is. Enemy gearing has popped up. Tier 10 Destroyer, that gearing could be a big problem for Mr. Frodo. He does manage to reset the cap. A little bit disappointing for Mr. Frodo. Capping XP is always great. But that gearing, he's got himself into a world of hurt now. He's got a speed boost active, so he's going to try and run away as quickly as possible. And here come torpedoes from that enemy destroyer. Oh boy, this could be close. Mr. Frodo slammed on the brake. He's got the engine full speed ahead. Oh my god, he managed to torpedo beat that just by the skin of his teeth. Will he get the kill? He set that gearing on fire. The gearing is laying a smoke screen and trying desperately to run away, but he is on fire. Even if these shots don't hit him, he's gonna die anyway. Finishes him off. There's his third kill. Not a bad game, though. 346,000 credits earned. 76,500 damage done. Three kills, no torpedo hits, only four fires, but a good number of shell hits. And he survived the battle, which is equally important. And he survived the battle, again, by playing smart, using those islands for cover, taking shots at what he could, and helping his team out as best as possible. He didn't get target fixated, and he was more than willing to switch over to other targets as necessary in order to, you know, provide the assistance that he could. He is top of the team for XP earned at well over 2,000 base XP, as we'll see here shortly. That's it for today's video, though. If you like the video, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, and leave a comment down below. If you'd like to get semi-regular channel news and updates, you can do so by liking and following me on Facebook. If you'd like to help support me and my channel, I encourage you to do so by visiting my Patreon and donating there. If you'd like to submit a World of Warships replay like this one to be featured on my channel, you can do so by sending it to my email messaging me on Facebook, or PMing me a link via YouTube. And if you'd like to watch me play World of Warships, among other games, live, you can follow me on Twitch. You can find the links for all of those in the video description down below. And as always, I'll see you next time. This is Captain Rye, signing off.